This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. It was 45 years ago in the spring of 1973 that hundreds of American POWs returned home from Vietnam as the U.S. ended its involvement in one of the most divisive wars in its history. Six years prior to that time, in January 1967, Barry Bridger was shot down over Sante in North Vietnam by a surface-to-air missile. Although listed for years as missing in action, he was captured and spent the rest of his time there in prison for many of those 2,232 days he was held at the infamous Hanoi Hilton that also housed the late Senator John McCain and Charlotte's own Quincy Collins. Barry Bridger is also a North Carolina native, uh, a captain in the Air Force at the time of his capture. He would retire in 1984 as a lieutenant colonel and with a chest full of medals, including the Silver Star, the Distinguished Flying Cross, a Purple Heart with Oak Leaf Cluster, a Meritorious Service, and Prisoner of War Medal, to name just a few. Lieutenant Colonel Bridger is in Charlotte today to speak to the World Affairs Council, Charlotte, and thanks to them, he joins us for the hour in our Spirit Square studio. Good morning and welcome to Charlotte. Glad to be here. Nice to have you here. Uh, you can join our conversation at Charlotte Talks at WFAE.org. Search for WFAE on Facebook. Get to us through Twitter at Charlotte Talks. You can watch us this morning on Facebook Live. And you can even go to our website for details, I think, or at least the, the web address for the WorldAffairsCouncil.org, where you can sign up to be part of the luncheon today that our guest is speaking at, and also a dinner tonight. So you are a native of Bladensboro, North Carolina. You earned your Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics at uh, UNC Chapel Hill in 1963. First thing he told me today was to divide by 12. That sounds hard to me. Uh, com <laughs> he commissioned as a second lieutenant through the ROTC program, and if I'm correct, you joined the Air Force, went through pilot training in 1964, learned to fly the F-4 Phantom. When did they send you to Vietnam? Well, my first tour of duty in the Vietnam theater would have been in about 1965 at Cameron Bay, which is in South Vietnam. We opened up that particular facility uh, with the help of Navy Seabees who put down uh, sheets of metal and we didn't have an actual run. We were rolling down like on a trampoline, <laughs> taking off with a Phantom and a load of bombs. And I didn't actually fly north at that time. All of our missions at that time were in South Vietnam supporting United States and Armed Forces. So at that time of the war, because this is well before uh, uh, people began to protest the war, well before we found out a lot of things that we know about the war today, what was the mission? What was the stated mission? What did they tell you you were there to do? Well, we were, at that time, we were in support of the government in South Vietnam. Um, the uh, North Vietnamese had defeated the, the French uh, forces in Dien Bien Phu, mm -hmm. a very famous uh, final battle up there. And uh, the thinking at that time was that uh, Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the North Vietnamese government and people, was going to make inroads to the south in violation of agreements that had been reached between the two uh, uh, sec sectors of, of the Vietnam Peninsula. And we were there to uh, make sure that uh, that the North did not overrun the South and violate those uh, agreements. So you were shot down in Vietnam, in North Vietnam, right. in, a couple of years later, 1967. When did we start making bombing raids over the North? Uh, 65, okay. 64, 65, and that the, time frame. And, and the reason we changed that tactic was what? Uh, because if, you, if you're really going to prosecute a war, you had to go where the head was, and, and, and the real problem was to the north. Right. And so we, we, we launched uh, the uh, – they had that attack on a, on a supposed attack on American ships out in, in the Gulf of Tonkin, and that became the pretext to start those air raids to the north. So you are an Air Force pilot, and, and there's a famous movie called Top Gun that starred Tom Cruise, oh, yeah. uh, which portrayed pilots as uh, elite members of the military and, and very confident, almost cocky. Of course, they were Navy flyers, so there may have been a different, <laughs> a difference. Between. They were fake flyers. <laughs> so <laughs> how would you describe yourself at that stage of your life and those you flew with, the, the, the guys who piloted these F-4 Phantoms? Well, I, I would agree with you. There's an 
an era of in, invincibility <laughs> sure. that uh, is just part of the turf right. if you're going to fly fighters at 700 miles an hour. So, yeah, that, I think that's a, that's a fair criticism. But we were also very serious about doing what we could do and doing it well, better than anybody else. So training and uh, application was important to us. The closest that most of us will ever come to flying 700 miles an hour, or at least in a jet that size, and, and, and watch how they maneuver, because passenger airplanes don't maneuver that mm -hmm. way, no. is watching it on film. Yeah. You, you did it. You flew them. Mm -hmm. What is that like? Uh, it's quite thrilling. Really? Yeah, eventually, not scary? Uh, eventually, uh, no, well, <laughs> not, not particularly scary, but uh, thrilling. But at a point, you get so used to it, it is like you know, getting up, walking across a room. You don't pay much attention. You're busy doing all the things that you should be doing as part of the mission. And, you know, it, the thrill of the flying and the things that we did, uh, it just fades away. Wow. You, you flew, I'm told, 200 combat hours, uh, flew more than 70 combat missions until you were shot down on January 23rd, 1967, shot down by a surface-to-air missile. Uh, in the moments after you were hit, and I'm sure this all happens like that, mm -hmm. but what goes through your mind? Because you, 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 you have to make some major decisions very quickly. What goes through your mind? Well, the day that I, I was shot down, we had launched with a new pod. We carried on the, the belly of the F-4 Phantom. And that pod was designed to jam the guidance signal of the SA-2 missile system that had been deployed into North Vietnam uh, by the Soviets. Okay. In fact, the Soviets were manning all the missile sites. It wasn't the Viet North Vietnamese that were shooting those things. It was the Soviets. And uh, we were told before we launched that if our pod did not work correctly when we, when we turned it on, and there were, we always flew in flights of four, to fly up next to your element leader, there was, was a leader and an element leader and two, two wingmen, and his pod would jam for both of you. Well, about seven years later, when I got out of North Vietnam, the scientists came in and briefed us, if your pod does not work, do not fly up next to your element leader. You'll double the reflected energy and be shot down. And, and he was right. Yeah. And if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't fly fighters. So there you go. So what happened? You get hit by this missile, surface-to-air missile. Where did it hit the aircraft, and well, what, what, what did you have to do? Well, because my pod was not working, uh -huh. I also had something called a raw scope. It was a, an instrument that... Uh, uh, that was able to detect any types of electronic signals coming up off the ground. Okay. So I could actually observe the acquisition radars of these SAM sites and their guidance signals from that raw scope, even because my pod wasn't working. Otherwise, it would jam your raw scope and you couldn't use it. So I was actually able to look at those signals coming off the ground, and I could detect a signal at left uh, 10 o'clock and back at, at, at left uh, 8 o'clock, and uh, I started looking down below me, and that day the weather was really bad. It was five, every 5,000 feet was a layer of clouds, and we were at 20,000 feet. And we were about 4,000 feet above a deck of clouds, which is not the place to be in a SAM environment because those things come up so fast. Right. you got literally a second or two to, to do something. And so I'm looking in, in the areas of where I see the potential of a missile coming up, and I see a fireball coming up through the clouds. So I hit the mic button and said, shark flight. Break left, SAMS, 10 o'clock low. And everybody turned left in what was called the pod formation. Everybody was very gently turning. I got nervous as a dickens because I knew I did not have a pod. And so I said, to heck with this. And I turned upside down and split S at 20,000 feet, running about 700 true airspeed. And when I did, uh, I did not know it. But in back to my left, a missile was coming in the back seat. And it went off. It blew the right wing off. It blew half the left wing off. It blew the tail off. Wow. And every light in the cockpit turned on. Now, I had never seen all the lights come on at once, but they all came on. Uh, one light said, you need to service your hydraulic uh, system. <laughs> the other one said, you're overheating on your left engine. Mm -hmm. the, another one said, you're on fire on the right engine. And there was one light that came on I had never seen that said, you're in deep kimchi. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, my backseater thought I was dead, mm -hmm. so he ejected. I didn't hear him go. I'm just sitting there mesmerized by all that I see, and the stick that I'm holding in my hand is just limp as a noodle. It's not doing anything. Right. 
and fire is everywhere. And so I'm just looking around, and finally my brain kicked into gear. So you probably need to leave. Hmm. So I reached down to grab my handles, and, and the G-forces, you can imagine what that aircraft was doing with all those uh, elements off, uh, right. blown off. It was just flipping every which way. And initially, I couldn't get hold of the handles to eject. And then my adrenaline kicked in, and I got hold of the handles, and I ejected. And right before I ejected, I said to myself, it is going to really be breezy out here. So I shut my eyes real tight, and I pulled the handle. And when I opened my eyes, I was blind. And I said, great, now I'm blind. And I reached up and grabbed at my face and discovered to my great joy that uh, my helmet had spun around on my head, and I was looking into the back of the helmet. And it's pretty dark back there. So the fuselage, which has no wings anymore That's and right. no tail, is just spinning. That's right. When you eject in a situation like that, how do you know if you're ejecting yourself upward away from the aircraft to the left, to the right, or down toward the ground? How do you know? You, you really don't know. And I knew I was at 20,000 feet roughly when the missile hit, and it's going to take a while to get to the ground. Right. But uh, you have no idea. How long does it take to get to the ground? It took a while because... Um, well, I take that back. It didn't take as long as it would have. Uh, when you eject out of a, a fighter, uh, you, you're, you eject in a seat, and then there's a drogue chute that stabilizes the seat mm -hmm. so that you're going down in a controlled 80 mile an hour okay. uh, down to the earth. And so I was going into these decks of clouds, and every time I'd go into a deck of cloud, I couldn't see a thing. It was so thick. And then I'd come out and look down below me, and I'd see another deck of clouds, maybe four or 5,000 feet, 2,000 feet below me. And I kept going thump, thump, thump through these decks. And you have a little sensor on the side of the ejection seat that is supposed to kick you out of the main seat and deploy your regular parachute when you hit 10,000 feet okay. above the ground. And uh, I looked at that sensor, and I said, how come that thing's not working? And, of course, I couldn't see the ground. Right. And I'm thinking, if I don't do something here pretty soon, based on my calculations, I was a math major, and I'm sitting there calculating how far I've gone down from 20,000 feet. I said, there's going to be dirt in one of these decks of clouds. So I've had enough of this. So I reached over and grabbed the handle, and I pulled it. That handle released you from the ejection seat, and now you have to deploy your own parachute. And so when I pulled it, it kicked me away from the main uh, the seat itself, and I saw a strap go up over my head, and I grabbed it. And I looked, and my parachute bag was above my head about nine feet. Mm. I thought, what the hell is that thing doing up there? I'd never done this. <laughs> so I pulled the bag down and looked. And I looked for the handle. The handle wasn't there. Well, the handle was right there on my shoulder the whole time, laced up through that strap so that the bag would deploy above me so you wouldn't break your neck when it, it deployed. So everything was working properly. I just had, had not a lot of practice of ejections. So, but yeah, well, you, 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 had, you obviously took parachute training but, yeah but but you've never no, nobody ever does this until they have to do it <laughs> that's right the first time for me it's got to be amazing but i pulled that bag down looked at it looked for a handle couldn't find one and in my brain said look around and i looked at my shoulder and there it was so you were listed as missing in action because during all this time i'm told uh no 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 parachute was seen uh by your fellow flyers because <clears> of the cloud decks and no beeper signal went off to say he's here that's that's an interesting story. Well, um, hold the story because we have to take a break, and, and I want to. I know this is going to be longer than the okay. twenty second story. Okay, <laughs> it will be. Okay, our, our guest is uh, U.S. Air Force retired Lieutenant Colonel Barry Bridger, who was shot down over Vietnam in the spring or the January of nineteen sixty seven, and we'll talk more about that and many other things revolving around his life in just a moment. It's Charlotte talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and the North Carolina Turnpike Authority offering NC Quick Pass transponders for automatically paid tolls when using the I-77 express lanes between Mooresville and Uptown. Details at ncquickpass.com. And UNCTV's Joy of Giving campaign through December 5th tonight, two newborn polar bear cubs make an Arctic journey on nature. Then Neil Diamond performs information at unctv.org slash specials. The future of energy tomorrow on this program. And believe it or not, newsflash, it isn't coal, but it is something that includes biofuels, solar, wind, battery storage. Duke Energy has plans for all of those and goals of generating 8,000 megawatts of renewable energy by 2020. But some groups believe that won't be enough to move us quickly to a sustainable energy future, and we will peek into that future and hear from both sides about it tomorrow on this program at 9.
More doctors are pushing back against the NRA and stepping into the gun violence debate. A new movement calls for more research and better training, but the NRA has said physicians should stay in their lane. Can this public health message address gun rights supporters and save lives? Why more doctors are saying, this is my lane. Next time on 1A. 1A coming up from 10 to noon after Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Our guest today is Lieutenant Colonel Barry Bridger, retired U.S. Air Force fighter pilot, shot down over Vietnam in January 1967, spent much of his time in North Vietnam in the beautiful downtown Hanoi Hilton, uh, 2,232 days in captivity. We'll talk about that as we go forward here. He's speaking today at lunch at the World Affairs Council Charlotte. You can get information about that on our website or at worldaffairscharlotte.org. And again tomorrow night at 6.30 at Queen's University. You can go to their website uh, at, or their Facebook page and find out about that. Your mom graduated from Queens. Absolutely. And played the organ in our church and taught piano and met my dad and got married and and then I came along. So here it is, homecoming. Yes. <laughs> homecoming. Right. So you were shot you were shot down in, in January of nineteen sixty seven and we just finished talking about the harrowing experience of ejecting uh, at seven hundred miles an hour. Um uh, over 40, well, how, how high up were we, 20,000 feet? I, yeah, I was right at 20,000 feet when I went out. Um, and the fact that, that people thought you were missing in action for years because no one saw your parachute deploy, no one heard the beeper signals from, from you. What happened there? On that day, uh, when the aircraft uh, for that raid returned, there were probably in the neighborhood of eight different aircraft uh, that witnessed that explosion for my aircraft. And uh, they saw no parachutes, no nothing. And when they landed, they, you have to debrief after all of these flights. They told the debriefers that, um, that I was, um, uh, there was no way anybody got out of that aircraft. And it both was, of you, you and your co-pilot, got yeah, out. Yeah, 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 we both got out. But they said no way anybody got out. It was an absolute direct hit, total explosion. And so what the um, military did, and in my case, they, they – um, notified my family that I was um, missing an action. That was the standard uh, um, set of words to describe somebody going down, missing an action. Right. But I was probably KIA. So it was MIA, probable KIA. Okay. That, that's rare to get that one. Well, when that, when that information flowed back to my home, uh, the, the, the community, only about 800 people in my little small hometown in the southeastern part of North Carolina, the uh, community broke up into two groups. One group said, not even Barry could get out of that. And the other group said, baloney. Barry did not die. Well, it took about almost four and a half years before finally North Vietnam released my name and my backseater's name. Right. And when that flowed into my hometown community, the place went bonkers. <laughs> And you weren't there to see it. No, and I didn't get to party with them. You know. So it was good. So it's, it's a cloudy, terrible day. I know that you probably know where you are, generally speaking, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're that high in the air, and you know what you're looking for, even though you can't necessarily see it. But do you know what you're parachuting into? You have, you have at least, what, 30 seconds to, to figure this out on the way down. Do you know what you're getting into? Well, the one thing that I was hoping for is that I would land in the jungle environment. But I wasn't quite sure where I was. Well, it turned out that I literally landed about 100 yards out, outside the prison. Mm -hmm. So they literally just opened the door and shooed me in. I'm an outdoorsman. I'd love to have had a shot at trying to escape and evade. But you can't escape and evade in, front, in the middle of two million people. See, Impossible. Yeah, and, and, and I understand that you landed about 200 yards away mm -hmm. from the Hanoi Hilton. From the Hanoi Hilton. Yeah, exactly. Door-to-door -door search. <laughs> oh, yeah. Couldn't run, no place to go, surrounded by people when you get on the ground. What is that experience? Well, like? when I came out of the clouds, remember, it was about every 1,000 to 2,000 feet, we had a deck of clouds. And the last deck of clouds was about 1,000 feet above the ground. It might have been 500 feet, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood. And they immediately started shooting at me. 
when I came through that last deck of clouds. You could hear the bullets going by. <laughs> and the, the only thing that saved me there was the fact that I was so close to the ground, they didn't have much of a chance to shoot accurately mm -hmm. before I hit the ground. And once I hit the ground, I was immediately captured by the Army and all the, the, um, the non-Army folks that have weapons as well. And I was taken directly into the prison camp. Mm. So at what point did they transfer you? I, I guess the prison, is the prison camp the Hanoi Hilton or is it? Okay. The Hanoi Hilton. So did you spend, I, I read that you only spent part of your time there, but you spent your whole time there, didn't you? I mean, why would they take you out and put you back? Well, they had about six <clears throat> to eight different prison camps in North Vietnam for okay. America's Vietnam POWs. Okay. And uh, I was probably in four or five of them. Over, over the period of my incarceration. And they moved you around primarily to disrupt your communication systems. In other words, if they leave a, leave a bunch of Yanks in a prison long enough, we'll figure out ways to talk to each other. But then you have to, if you move to a new camp, you don't have a clue how to do it. Right. So you have to start over. You don't have the code. That's so. right. We had to develop those systems. So, 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 when you're in these camps... When you were in these camps, uh, were you isolated? Were you in solitary confinement? Were you put together in cells at all? Or, or, and were you just tapping through the walls of cells to talk to each other? Could you hear each other? What was it like? What happened to you really had a lot to do with which year you want to talk about because everything moved all over the place. For the first four and a half years, we were in an environment of torture, constantly going to torture chambers. Uh, when Ho Chi Minh died... In uh, 69, the North Vietnamese, and he was the leader of the North Vietnamese government and the people. Right. And he was the cross we had to bear. Uh, but when he died, the North Vietnamese government was get, afforded an opportunity to change policy about treatment. And they did. It was dramatic. I might hasten to add, uh, it was never in accordance with the Geneva Conventions, to which we were entitled as uniform armed combatants. Um, Has it, anybody ever paid a price for that? Oh, heck no. Okay. And uh, it, it also, um, uh, we also uh, uh, never saw the Red Cross. And uh, although the torture stopped at the end of about four and a half years. And wasn't that in part, in part not just the death of Ho Chi Minh, but the, the fact that the uh, International Red Cross came through and condemned the North Vietnamese for their treatment, and, good, they, and they wanted to look better in the eyes of the world? Good point. Um, in, the, in the summer of 1969, the International Red Cross roundly and soundly condemned the government of North Vietnam for its mistreatment of American POWs. Mm -hmm. Ho dies that fall in 69. Ah. And so the government was given an opportunity to change policy, and they did. It was dramatic, but it was never in accordance with the Geneva Conventions. We never saw the Red Cross, and we had men going legally blind for lack of simple vitamins. You have said, and you said it here, but you said it even more dramatically, that they systematically and brutally tortured every senior leader until they wrote a confession that was read over the camp radio system. Did that include you? Uh, I wasn't a senior ranking officer, but, yeah, I was in the torture chamber a lot with everybody else. But the senior leaders were isolated. They went through a special punishment camp we called Alcatraz, and they were brutally tortured to uh, write a confession, which was then read over the camp radio system in an attempt to discredit our senior leadership and to demoralize the junior officers and NCOs. So now, we ignored those confessions. When you heard these confessions, what were they confessing to? All that, that, that we had bombed the damned and dyke systems of North Vietnam and flooded the place and killed hundreds of uh, civilians, all of which was a lie. And why didn't that work on you? Why didn't, because maybe the senior leaders knew something you didn't know. Why, why didn't that work on the rank and file? Now, what do you mean by that? Well, you said that, that you paid no attention to it. You just disregarded it and you didn't believe it. And, and, and it was yeah, we ignored propaganda. those confessions. We knew exactly why? how they'd been extracted. Okay. They, okay. They'd been through the torture ringer just like everybody talk to, else. Talk to me about the torture. What was that? What, what did they do? They had a variety of different techniques of torture, but the, the principal one ones we call the straps. What they would do is put your hands behind your back. And this and, happened to you. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. Put your hands behind your back in manacles. Now, manacles aren't loose or rigid. And then they'd take about a 20-foot long nylon strap and they'd start at your wrist and they'd lace it so that they, they, they laced it all the way up to your shoulders from behind till they ripped your shoulders out of the sockets. 
it was extremely painful. And uh, it, after you had been through the straps one time, you might have to go five to six months before you could literally get your hands up to your nose right. you know, as you recovered from all that trauma. And then, you, depending on who you were, you got to go back into the torture chamber and do it all over again. You have said that a lot of guys would go into that torture chamber and they would try to stay in that situation <laughs> for as long as they could yeah. because that allowed them to spare others the agony they were going through. Uh, right. We made it a competition, and only a bunch of Americans and Yanks would come up with such a crazy idea, say who could stay in the torture chamber the longest. <laughs> Good but, Lord. but the idea was to occupy the torture chambers and deny its shoes for a fellow POW. How did, you, how did the collective reach that? If you, if you had difficulty... Um, communicating with each other. How did you come to that decision? Well, we, we, we got very sophisticated on our ability to communicate with each other in spite of the fact we were in little concrete boxes all over the place. Those concrete boxes, uh, if you tap on them, they carry sound. Right. And uh, the, what we had to do was figure out a way to clear the area before we communicated so nobody would be able to hear or observe anything. And we figured out all kinds of ways to do that. And initially... We did all of our communicating by tapping. Was it Morse code? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no. It was the alphabet. We threw out one letter, so we had five rows and, and five columns. Okay. And then we tapped down to a row and over to a column to get a letter. And we got real good at doing this. That was called, we called that, um, um, oh, heck, uh, analog communications. <laughs> well, and then, we, then we came up with what we called digital communications. We developed our own hand code. Instead of a deaf mute code, we developed letters that we could use with our hands that were big that you could see at a distance. And remember, we were all pilots. We had good eyes. Mm -hmm. And we could look about 100 yards if you held up your hand and watch you send code with your fingers if you used big letters. And we, we had our own system. And that we called digital communication. It was fast as lightning. Wow. When you were talking about being tortured, and the idea of staying in the torture chambers l as long as you could so that you couldn't, you could prevent others from going mm -hmm. in there. You were smiling. You even laughed. Now, I know it's been a long time since then, but this speaks to something else that you have said about this experience in Vietnam. You said that, and you emphatically say, that the American Vietnam POW experience is not a story about the plight of Americans in Southeast Asia. You say the real story is a revelation of the power of American values and the importance of Americans holding a common set of values that put others in front of self. Because you say Americans live a cause that is greater than ourselves. I think that was true in 1965, 67, mm -hmm. 72. Mm -hmm. Is it true today? Well, let me, let me add to what you've said. I, well, I, I go all around this earth talking about values because in the prison camps of North Vietnam, I was a witness to the powerful and to pervasive impact that traditional American values had on my fellow POWs to not only engage but to survive the pressure cooker environment of the Hanoi Hilton. If you were captured by the North Vietnamese, you were placed into a concrete box. You had no idea what was about to happen. You were all alone with your thoughts and your values. Eventually, you were taken to an interrogation and given two choices. Cooperate fully with the North Vietnamese camp authority or go to the torture chamber. Without any idea what their fellow POWs had done, one by one, all of America's Vietnam prisoners of war exercised the values they held in common and chose the torture chamber. Does that come from your military training, or did it come, do you think, from your upbringing and the American values that you talk about espousing? It came from our upbringing. It came from parenting. It came from community. So I want to go back to the question I asked you a second ago. That was true in 1965. I lived through it. I remember it. Is it true today? You can tell I'm hesitating. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it's true for those who go into service still, because they, there's a, there is a very important element of patriotism for those who join our, the men and women who, who, who serve in uniform. And they, they come from all walks of life all across the country. But it's interesting um, that um, we, we all did the same thing, not knowing what anybody else had done. Yeah. And I think the people who serve today in our armed forces are, this, uh, are cut from the same cloth. Does that Maybe not as many to choose pull from, but who, whoever ends up there, they have the same attitudes. You were a generation from the greatest generation mm -hmm. that fought in World War II and went through the Great Depression, and, and that was a time of, 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 of self-sacrifice and, and, and pulling one for all and all for one. Exactly. Uh, I think those who are attracted to the military today perhaps still have that somehow, or maybe they, it's because their parents served and their great-grandparents served and they come from that tradition. Yeah, I think so, too. How, how do we get it back? How do we get it back in society at large? Because it just seems to me today, it's all about me. The hell with you. It's all about me. Well, I... Um I think that one of the things that, uh, well, one of the things, I travel all over the place and I talk to a lot of people and I talk to a lot of academicians. And I always ask the same question. How many, how many hours on the principles and practices of liberty do you expose your students to over a four-year education? And it, I would be hard-pressed to remember anybody that said anything other than zero. In other words, civics was a big thing all through my uh, educational process. Uh, the, everything in my community reflected the same attitudes. Right. They all thought the same way. But I think uh, having available in the educational process there's something about principles and practices of liberty is a dang good idea, and it's not there. Well, you talk about the most cherished value Americans hold in common, or at least held in common then, was our love of liberty. But that yeah. liberty is something that isn't free. It comes at a price. Oh, absolutely. And you guys were willing to pay that price, and you understood that liberty comes at a price. Oh, yeah. But that was at a time when not only did you have volunteers and people went to ROTC like you did and, and, mm -hmm. and went in as a commissioned officer, it was a time of, of a military draft. There was a tradition of serving the country, either there or in the Peace Corps or, or somewhere else. Which went away as a large, in large part because of the Vietnam War. They eliminated the draft because it was so unpopular. Is that, a, is that something that we should is, – is, is the concept of national service of some sort something that should come back? I don't think it's necessary. I think we have adequate forces because we also have uh, the most sophisticated capabilities to, to conduct warfare of anybody. So it's, it's not like we need lots and lots of people, mm -hmm. but we need people, obviously, that are committed. Lieutenant Colonel Barry Bridger is our guest. He spent uh, 2,232 days in, in captivity in Vietnam, much of it in the Hanoi Hilton. We'll come back and talk about that experience and his roommates when we come back. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Charlotte Center City Partners with Holidays in the City, offering dozens of opportunities to celebrate the season in the heart of Uptown Charlotte. Holidays in the City, CLT.com. And SunTrust Bank, providing private wealth management teams of local advisors to help navigate the life clients have built and help prepare for whatever life brings. Confidence starts here. More info at SunTrust.com slash reserve. At the end of October, the American College College of Physicians released a paper detailing the public health risk of guns. The NRA asked doctors to stay in their lane about guns. Many said no. How are doctors across the country responding to the sheer number of guns in America? How are they talking to their patients about guns? That will be the topic of the conversation in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock during 1A with Joshua Johnson and his guests. And we will continue our conversation with Lieutenant Colonel Barry Bridger in just a moment. Stay with us. Hey y'all, this is Tommy Tomlinson. On this week's episode of Southbound, we talked to author R.J. Young, who plunged headlong into American gun culture. The experience led to his new book, Let It Bang. You can find this and every episode of Southbound on Apple Podcasts, NPR One, and WFAE.org. 
Support for Southbound comes from Southeast Radiation Oncology Group. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins, and our guest today is uh, Lieutenant Colonel, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Barry Bridger, who was shot down in January of 1967 over North Vietnam and stayed there until 1973 Three. when uh, all of our POWs were released. Um, you have said that during that time in Vietnam, the Vietnamese were fanatics about communism, and to them, you say, truth is what serves the revolution. No, of course. Uh, uh, we're going through a period here today where truth seems to be malleable, where facts are denied when they are inconvenient or don't serve the narrative, where truths are being described as lies, even as lies are being told us as though they were truths. Have we lost our way? Uh, let me give you an example of... Um, something that, that has bugged me since I came out of Hanoi, which, ha, which uh, uh, suggests that some of our big institutions have lost their way, not just people. I came out of North Vietnam, and within two weeks, I was home in Bladenboro, North Carolina. And uh, the phone rang, and I picked it up, and this individual, and this is best my memory serves me, um, I know... Uh, I won't, I won't name the network, but it was one of the major networks. It was a lady. She says, um, she says, uh, Captain Bridger, we would like to fly you to New York and be on our program on uh, this Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I responded, why? One of my favorite comments. <laughs> and, and this lady said, well, the American people want to know what happened in North Vietnam. I was thunderstruck. Because, as I said to her, I said, Ma'am, are you aware that not all of the POWs are out of Hanoi? There's probably another couple of hundred to come out. And her response was, yes, we know that, but the American people deserve to know what happened. I said, Ma'am, are you listening carefully? She said, yes. I said, the American people don't give a tinker's damn what happened until they get their men back. And I hung up the phone and said, no, I'm not coming. Bye. Mm -hmm. About two weeks later, the phone rings, same individual, same offer, same response by me. Why? And she said, well, all the POWs are out of Hanoi. I said, where did you get that? She said, I read it in the paper. I said, okay. I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, do you think that there are some moms and dads, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles who are still praying that their loved ones are going to come out of that hell hole? Do you think we owe them... Uh, any, any sense of passion and concern, empathy. And she, she was without words at that point. I said, ma'am, I'm not coming. It's too early. No. I, that was a signal to me that began to play out over time. Mm -hmm. I began to, I, I loved to watch the news before I walked, went into Hanoi. And I was ready to reacquaint myself with all the facts and figures of the news media. But it appeared to me, at least from my thinking, that I should not put my faith in networks, but in individuals who I felt could not be co-opted. Howard K. Smith, Chet Huntley, uh, um, David Brinkley. These were news people of the first magnitude. You didn't mention Walter Cronkite. No. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. Is that because he the, came out against the, the, the self-serving word? Is, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it wanted, that was when some of those individuals wanted to become well-paid and be anchors. Okay. You know. Okay. And so, but they all were. Everybody you talked to, uh, Howard K. Well, Smith was an ABC anchor. Yeah, well, Chet yeah. Huntley and David Brinkley did the nightly news on NBC. I, that's true. But that all started in the Vietnam War, but all that thrust came out of the, 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 what they reported so, on in the Vietnam. So, so what I'm hearing you say is you don't trust the media, but is that, is that because, for instance, in the case of that producer who called you, because I, I was obviously a producer trying to book a show, uh, was that simply because she hadn't gone through what you went through, didn't understand, it's a lack of understanding? That's common sense, in my opinion. Okay. I, no, I don't give her any any slack. Okay, come on, but, we got but, but people still in but harm's a, way. But there's a difference between 
that lack of understanding and the lack of common sense, to use your term, and fake news is the difference. She wasn't deliberately trying to lie. She was trying to get to the truth. You just didn't think the time was right to get to the truth. Yeah, and I think it was pretty simple uh, calculus to make. <laughs> Very simple, with 200 people still so in my, So my original question was about uh, truth uh, uh, and, and about uh, how we're, we're, truth seems to be all over the place today. It is what, what we want it to be. Is that where it, Are you saying that you agree with that approach, or are you saying that, that – that the attacks on the media my, are justified. My experience with the media before I was shot down and ended up in Hanoi was wonderful. Okay. I trusted everybody. Okay. I had no reason not to. They never gave me a reason, common sense or otherwise. But when I came out of Hanoi, we were in a hyperbolic environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was pretty obvious to me that somebody wanted a story more than they wanted those people out of Hanoi. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to participate in it. You know, this, th that war deeply, deeply mm -hmm. divided this country. And one Army veteran has said that the war drove a stake right through the heart of America. Yeah, it, it, it caused a lot of problems. There was a lot of change in the culture. And this is one of the things that changed. Yes. Trust. And, yes, but, but I didn't have any problem listening to certain specific individuals that I felt, mm -hmm. without a doubt, could not be co-opted into doing anything that was inappropriate. Okay. Howard K. Smith and none of those people you just mentioned mm -hmm. were about to, uh, to tell me, uh, you know, come on up on the program, and, you know, I think we, the other, those 200 are still left behind. Hopefully they'll get out. They didn't do that. They wouldn't do that. Okay. When, when, when would have been the right time for that producer to make that phone call? Uh, probably uh, a couple of weeks after or a week at the most, or the, at the least, you know, to show some empathy okay. and say so. Out of empathy for the people who are still praying for their loved ones to come out, easy thing to say for anybody in the media. Right. We are not going to uh, start bombarding the airways with all these salacious stories. Right. Well, let's, let's share some stories. Uh, let's go back to the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, you were, how many people were housed in that facility at any, at, at any given time? About in, in, the, in, this, um, in, in the Wallow Prison, better known as the Hanoi Hilton, there's probably 250 to 300 POWs. But remember I said it was five to seven different prison camps, and they moved all over the place. Right. Then the, the another 300 scattered into those. And you were there at the time that uh, Charlotte's Quincy Collins was there, and I believe you were there. At the, yeah, I know you were there at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the late Senator John McCain yeah. was there. You said that John McCain, I'm going to have to paraphrase this because I didn't take a note on it, but you had some incredibly complimentary things to say, not only about the senator, but also you had some things to say about how badly he was treated. John McCain was the most seriously injured prisoner of war to arrive in North Vietnam. He, uh, he had uh, two broken arms, a broken leg, a broken shoulder, a bayoneted foot, and a bad attitude as a result. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that goes without saying. <laughs> and um, he, he, he immediately went from about 165 pounds, his, uh, his normal weight, uh, in about 30 days, maybe 45 days, down to around 100 pounds. He was just dying. And the North Vietnamese saw an opportunity to make some political hay. Mm -hmm. So he was carried to an interrogation with the cat, the chief interrogator. And the cat said to John, said, um, we will allow you to go home early because we cannot treat your injuries. And would you like to do that? And John's response at that first meeting was, I'll tell you tomorrow. So the next day, they brought him in, and he said, what is your answer? He says, no, I will only go home in order of shoot-down. I will not go ahead of someone who's been here before me. And the, the cat said, is that your final answer? And uh, John said, yes. Then the cat said, very well. Now it will go very badly for you. And they took him to the torture chamber and rebroke his arm. Because they knew who he was. Oh, hell yes. That, that was the political hay they were yeah. trying to make. His father was yeah. an, an admiral? Admiral, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, 
when, when he was running for office, uh, candidate Donald Trump disparaged John McCain's heroism uh, and those of many other vets, it would seem to me, by saying of McCain, he's not a war hero. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured. He's since gone on to become the commander in chief. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, this sounds political, doesn't it? Um, what, um, what Trump does not understand is, as a prisoner of war, war is every day. You never quit fighting the war. But, but, but do you understand how somebody could say that? Yes, he didn't, he, he didn't put things in proper perspective because if he'd have been with us up there in Hanoi watching, uh, the, watching everybody walk into the torture chambers back and forth, he'd have a different attitude about the war and about being captured and about putting, uh, surviving. But that's, that's, that's Trump's bad side. He, he, he speaks before he thinks. He double speaks. He contra contradicts himself. However, if you said to me, uh, uh, am I willing to forgive that? Yeah, I am. Uh, here's why. Um, Trump, in my mind, is the Bobby Knight of politics. Bobby Knight was really rough on his uh, players in public, throwing chairs across gym floors, chasing referees out of the daggone gym. But he was a winner, and nobody would refute it. Probably the best basketball, basketball coach of mine ever. An amazing uh, fellow. Uh, would I like to see uh, uh, our president have a different tone? Yes, but I'm not going to trade that for doing the right thing about the country. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, it wasn't until 1970 that Hanoi acknowledged that they had you mm -hmm. in, in captivity. And your family, I'm told, received its first letter from you in May mm -hmm. of that year, 1970. Had you been writing them all along and they just didn't send your letters? Or did they say, okay, we're going to tell the world you're here and now you can write a letter? I wasn't allowed to write anything for the first, oh, good grief, four or five years that I was there. Nothing. But after Ho died, mm -hmm. they started loosening it up, and we were able to do some writing. I, I think I was given about two, two opportunities to write. Did they let you have le letters back? Was your family able to respond to those uh, letters? In, in general, they did not. Uh, occasionally, they would get a, like I had a, a letter sent to me by a former girlfriend and which she uh, was telling me that she had moved on with her life. So they read it over to Camp Radio, <laughs> that right. type of thing. Dear John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dear John. <laughs> I got my dear John in Hanoi. <laughs> and I thought, well, say la vie, you know. <laughs> I can't do anything anyway. Um, but uh, uh, I did get to write some letters. And what I did is, I, I, although I wasn't uh, one of the individuals that, that was trained to, to write in code, I was able to write my own code. For example, I went, one of the letters I wrote home was, well, it's Christmas time, and I know you'll be putting the old family uh, tree up, and you're going to decorate it with my favorite red, white, and blue lights, and then you're going to put the old family hawk on top of the tree to show everybody in town how I feel. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> Which they didn't know because they're <laughs> they had a cultural clue, reference. The old family hawk. <laughs> Despite the physical torture, maybe because of the physical torture and the years of captivity, you developed, I read, this is pretty amazing, gymnastics skills. Now, had you had any gymnastics training prior to going in there? Because at the end of this thing, you had been practicing gymnastics, I guess, to get back into shape, right? Mm-hmm. You... You could do a handstand on either your right or left hand, 50 handstand push-ups, and you learned to juggle while you were manacled. Well, let me juggling? Well, I, I'm, <laughs> well let, let me start with the handstands. All right. When Dick Nixon was elected president, we figured that out. I said, well, I'll be going home soon, so I better get in shape. Okay. So I said, now what am I going to do? I want to do something that I've never done. And as far as I'm concerned, nobody else has done it. At least I haven't seen it. I'm going to learn to do one hand handstands with either hand. That's what I'll do. Well, the mm -hmm. first thing I discovered was I, I, I had a bucket. I turned the bucket upside down, put a blanket on top. I put my left hand on it, my other right hand on the floor, kicked up into a handstand. 
and then started trying to figure out uh, how I was going to do one hand and hand hands. The first thing I discovered was, with all that torture, uh, my shoulders were really weak. And if you can't extend your shoulder out of the socket, you can't balance yourself. Right. I mean, you're locked. And so I spent one year doing handstand push-ups to strengthen my shoulders. One year. And I got up to where I could do sets of 50, one, one set after another. I got really strong doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I said, now it's time to learn how to do a one-hand handstand. I spent another year learning to do that. But when I finished, I could stand up, take one step, jump in the air, and land on one hand on either hand and stay there for about a minute. Wow. It's been a long time. Uh, you, you got out of Vietnam. You've had a very successful life since getting out of Vietnam. When you put it all into perspective, what did that period feel? How did that period of your life affect the rest of it? And I have about 30 seconds. How, how did that period of, of your life affect you going forward? It, pro it profoundly uh, uh, reaffirmed the, uh, the, the upbringing that I had experienced. Uh, there's a lot more to my life than what we've set, talked about so far. I was an orphan. Oh. I, I, I could have been aborted. I wasn't. I was still alive. And uh, then I was adopted by the most incredible family you can possibly imagine down in the southeast of North Carolina, the Bridger family. Wow. We have to leave it at that. We should come back and talk right. some more. We can or do that. see him at Queens or, at, or today at the World Affairs Council. U U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Retired Barry Bridger. Thanks for the hour. Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins.